All right, so let's quickly uh, go over these ones here, guys, and then we'll move on to the rest of it here. So what's the distinction between work and heat? Okay, Work and heat are both transfers of what? Energy. It's the type of energy they transfer that's different. Okay, Heat, heat's a transfer of thermal energy. Okay, That's why it's part of thermodynamics, whereas work is a transfer of mechanical energy. Okay, so work is a transfer of mechanical energy, that's potential and kinetic and that kind of stuff, whereas heat is a transfer of thermal energy. All right, for number four, what, uh, identify whether each of the following is best explained by the first or second law of thermodynamics. So, quick review here. First law of thermodynamics is essentially the law of conservation of energy. Okay, energy can't be created, it can't be destroyed, it can be transferred and converted. All right, um, and then the second one, okay, the second law of thermodynamics is heat always flows from hot to cold. All right. So, for a bouncing ball eventually comes to rest on the floor. Which law is that? If it's if it's constantly lowering, lowering, lowering and eventually coming to rest, what's happening to all of its energy? Right, it's going into the ground, it's being turned into sound. Is that transferring from a high energy object to the surroundings? Okay, which law is that? First or second? Second law. Okay, second law of thermodynamics. Metal spoon eventually becomes hot when placed in a pot of boiling water. Which one's colder, the spoon or the boiling water? The spoon. So which law is that? Second. Heat always goes from hot to cold. All right, the end of the spoon, Trent, the energy transfers up the spoon. Second law of thermodynamics. Okay, energy cannot be created or destroyed. First law, yeah, has to be. Okay, that's what the first law is. Energy can't be created, can't be destroyed. Right, so it's first law there. All right, number five. What is the difference between a heat engine and a heat pump? Give an example of each. Well, a heat engine uses the second law of thermodynamics in order to generate, okay, uh, thrust or movement or something like that. Okay, it uses a hot area next to a cold area and puts whatever needs to be worked on in between the two as energy and matter flow between the hot to the cold the turbine or whatever it happens to be is turned and as a result work is done okay a heat pump though okay goes the other way it transfers heat from the hot area okay or from the from a relatively cool area into a hotter area right it is going backwards from the second law of thermodynamics and it must use energy in order to do that Right? A heat engine will naturally operate because heat is always moving naturally from hot to cold. But a heat pump has to put energy in. It's kind of like active transport. It's working against the gradient. Oh yeah, you definitely need to know which what the first law of the second law is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so give an example of each. A jet engine is an example of a heat engine. Okay. A heat pump, refrigerator, air conditioner. Okay, either one of those. Okay, for number eight, two sticks are rubbed together and ignite. Is the work being done on the sticks positive or negative work? Okay, and explain why. Okay. Um, from the stick's point of view, yes, the energy that's turning into heat and sound would be negative because it's losing that energy. But the sticks are gaining energy from you moving them back and forth. So it's a chicken and egg question. Really, both answers could be argued here. All right, The energy that's the form of heat and ignition and stuff like that from friction is energy that's lost by the by the by the sticks, but the movement of the of the sticks is mechanical energy that you are giving to the sticks as a result of you moving. So it depends on which way you look at that question, really. All right. Water is observed to condense on the outside of a cold glass. Which way is heat flowing? Without without the context of the question, without the, the condensing part, which way should heat flow if whatever's in the glass is cold? It should go from the surroundings 
to whatever is in the glass, right? Because heat always goes from hot to cold. The condensation that forms on the outside is the evidence that that is happening. Okay, so if you've got your glass of cold liquid here, okay, so it's got this fluid in it, and you start seeing the, the bubbles kind of forming or the, the little droplets forming on the outside, it's because the water vapor that is in the air, when it comes into contact with the glass, it's got more energy than the glass, and it transfers its energy to the glass, and when it does that, it changes state from vapor to liquid, and that's why water appears on the outside of the glass, because the energy is transferring from the air, and from the water vapor in the air, into the glass. All right, so the more of that you see on the glass, the warmer your drink is getting. All right, everybody with me on that one? Okay, same thing happens with your glasses. If you wear glasses and you come in from outside, right? You walk in from outside and okay, they fog right up. Right? Same thing is happening. Energy from the water vapor that is in the air is being transferred to the lenses of your glasses, and as a result, it condenses onto the lens of your glasses and you can't see anything. All right. Does all of those make sense? Okay. All right. So development of engine technology. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about kind of the uh, path through which uh, we developed engines and simple machines and things like that, okay? Because it's important as uh, important for explaining how we discovered how energy works. All right. Most of the first engines were pumps of some kind. Okay. People needed to move water for various reasons because water won't flow uphill on its own. Stupid lazy water. Okay. It simply won't go up the hill, so they had to have some kind of a pump, right? Especially if we were talking about people in a mine or something like that. It wasn't safe to be in a mine in the lower parts of it because they would sometimes fill up with water, and that could be dangerous. So they developed things like the Archimedes screw, okay? Well, the Archimedes screw is really a pump, but it doesn't work well over long distances. It's fine if it's only a couple of feet long, okay? But after that, you can't spin it fast enough for it to work. Right? Because essentially what it is, is just an inclined plane. And have you ever tried to push water up a ramp? What always happens to it? It comes back. Have you ever been at a boat launch? Water goes up the ramp and then it comes back down. Okay? Gravity sucks. It's always working against you. All right? So the Archimedes screw is essentially just allowing you to turn the ramp all the time. If you can turn the ramp fast enough, you can get the water to come up and come out. But again, only over a short distance because over longer distances, there's not enough friction on that surface to hold the water on there and it eventually just runs back down. All right. So it was great. It was a great idea initially. All it really is, as its name implies, is a screw. Okay. A screw is an inclined plane that's wrapped around an axis. Okay. That's why Sheldon Cooper, whenever someone does something that gets them in trouble, says to them, you're an inclined plane wrapped around an axis you're screwed. Okay. All right. Um, and the other one here, the Persian wheel, similar idea. Okay, if we want to pump water from this canal or reservoir, you've got this wheel here that's essentially got little buckets on it. Okay, and these little buckets will pick up the water as they come through, and when they get to the top, it spills out, and it's caught by this little platform here. All right, so when it falls back, okay, it doesn't fall back into the water. It falls onto this platform, and then it can run away somewhere else. All right, it would seem equally effective to just build this platform under the a little bit lower and have it run down without the wheel, but that's just me. Okay, all right. Uh, so first machines okay, that used a hidden source of energy was Hero's steam engine. Right. Hero was one of the first people to develop a steam engine. Okay. And it used hidden energy. That is, you burned something in order to make heat, and that heat turned, it boiled the water and turned it into steam, and then the steam could push the piston up and down. All right. Right. But his machine was just a novelty device. It didn't work very well. It wasn't very useful. Okay. Uh, so people didn't recognize that heat could be used to do mechanical work. Okay, heat could be transformed into, or thermal energy could be transformed into mechanical energy. All right, so we had humans and animals doing all the necessary tasks for the long time. Wood was used to fuel fires. But there was no need to invent sophisticated machines. Okay, then the Industrial Revolution comes along, and suddenly, you know, having beasts of burden in the factory is becoming a problem. All right. You don't want a bunch of, you know, oxen or horses or whatever in the factory turning all the machines because well, they 
poop and pee everywhere, and it would make the factory all stinky. Okay, and you have to clean up after them all the time. So it wasn't really desirable. You had to have feed in there. They always, you know, you always had to be feeding them whatever. It was just a pain in the neck. It would have been easier to just have a machine that could use some hidden source of energy, okay, to do the job. All right, and that's where these kind of ideas came from. All right. Reciprocating pump here is another example. This was a big deal because unlike these two pumps, it could actually work in both directions. It could create a suction effect whether it was moving in or out. All right. So you could, uh, when you pulled it out like this, this this valve moved up. Okay. So as the piston moves this way, this valve moves up, and water is drawn in to the pumping chamber. All right. When you push the uh, the piston back the other way, this valve closes, this one opens, and the water you sucked in a minute ago is now forced out and into the pipe, so it's a reciprocating pump. Okay? Now, again, that was person-powered, but you could also have a machine attached to that okay, that had you know, a gas engine or something like that that could do the same job. All right. Now, the gunpowder engine. Okay? Our first example okay, of a true internal combustion engine. Luckily, it never caught on, nor, in fact, was it ever built, because it was way too dangerous. But it was the right idea. Okay? The gunpowder engine would have worked, okay, again, theoretically, because when you blow something up, okay, you take, let's say, gunpowder, and you ignite it, and it detonates, what do you get a lot of? You get a lot of energy. You get a lot of heat. What does the heat do if you've trapped it in a container like this? Right, it increases the temperature of whatever else is in there, the gases. What happens to gases when you make them hotter? They, they expand. Okay, that is the principle behind the internal combustion engine, the same one that's in your car, your lawnmower, okay, all of that kind of stuff. They all work on the same principle. When you detonate a fuel of some kind, it creates heat, and the heat causes gases to expand. And if you're in a, you know, a sealed chamber, those gases will exert pressure against any movable part. All right, that's what happens in the gunpowder engine. When you detonate the gunpowder, the piston moves up. All right, because the gases expand and they push on it. It's the only part of the thing that can move, so it gets pushed up. The problem is, it's the only part of the machine that can move, and it can't move far enough, so usually the gunpowder engine explodes. Undesirable, okay, if you're working next to it. All right, but the idea was there. The other problem with this is, well, it can only be used once. Once you blow this thing up, it's really hard for you to reset it and try again. All right? It's not exactly a reciprocating engine. It doesn't move up and down. It moves up one time, and then it's kind of cooked. All right? So it was, a, it was a good idea to at least to demonstrate the power of expanding gases. All right? The heat engine, we've talked about that already. Okay? We had two hollow hemispheres okay, uh, together, create a vacuum inside by extracting air, okay? and then you could pull in opposite directions okay, and create this. Um, you couldn't pull the, the hemispheres apart. Okay? And the other discovery was that water when you turn it into a vapor, so when you convert water to steam, it increases its volume 1,300 times. Okay, So if I had one liter of water and I evaporated all of it into a gas, I would need at one atmosphere, okay, atmospheric pressure, I would need 1,300 liters of space to contain it all. All right. Now, most of the time when we evaporate water, all right, it's in a closed chamber. So now we've got something that needs to take up 1,300 times more space, but it doesn't have 1,300 times more space. So what does it do? It exerts pressure. It exerts force on the inside of that container. And if any parts of that container are movable, they move. And that can be used to do work because movement is mechanical energy. That's turning heat into mechanical energy. All right, everybody follow me there? So we're taking heat, we're making it expand something, and that expansion can do work. All right. Okay, um, the savory engine, steam engine idea here. This steam engine was, again, supposed to be used as kind of a pump. Okay, so we invented this first successful steam-powered pump. Okay, and again, it pumped water out of mines. We talked about how important that was. Okay, the pump could lift water only six meters. All right. So it wasn't great. I mean, it was better than a bucket brigade, right? which is a bunch of guys with pails, right? and one guy's standing in the water, and he passes the bucket to the next guy, and he passes it to the next guy. And then you got somebody running the buckets back down afterwards. This is better than that. 
but again, it only works over six meters. Okay, here were some of the drawbacks. First off, it's an external combustion engine. The fire is outside of the pressure vessel. All right, so the, the water and the steam is in here in the boiler. All right, but the heat, the heat source is outside. So are you, is all of the heat from this fire being used to boil the water? No, a lot of it is heating the surroundings, and that's inefficient. Okay, all external combustion engines have the same problem. They're not efficient because a lot of the heat escapes to the surroundings. All right, so that was a big problem. The other problem is, is at the time this was built, it was difficult to fashion metal parts um, to a nice finish that could seal up effectively. Okay, you couldn't, um, you know, seal things together and make a pressure vessel out of metal that didn't leak. All right, or that steam didn't escape from. There was a limit to the pressure they could withstand, and as soon as you went over that pressure, hot steam starts venting out of whatever place failed first, and if you were standing next to that, you were in trouble, because right, you'd get really badly scalded by this hot steam escaping under high pressure. All right, so the limitations for most of the early steam engines were the same. Finding good ways to fashion sealed containers out of metal that could withstand the heat, but also withstand the pressure. All right, so the new common engine, his was a bit better, and it get, had kind of a reciprocating thing with this pulley, right? But again, it was also an external combustion engine, okay? Um, yeah, so similar to that. Okay, Watt. Watt came along. His engine was the, one of the best steam engines there was, right? Which is why the unit for power is named after him, okay? You ever use, you know, wattage on a watt light bulb? Watts, that's this guy, okay? So... His job, okay, he was always repairing the new common engine because they broke all the time, right? He was shocked by its poor performance. He realized that there was so much heat that was being wasted having this um, water heated and cooled in the same cylinder. Because you have to imagine with the new common engine, the cylinder, okay, was sealed up. So you heated it and you got the, you got the piston to move upwards, okay? But then the only way to get the piston to move back down was to cool off the whole chamber so all these hot gases that were pushing up on the piston would recondense back into liquid water and the piston could fall back down. All right? Is that a fast process? Not at all. Because what do you have to do? You have to spray cold water all over this all over this cylinder, and usually the cold water falls in the fire and puts the fire out. You gotta start all over again. Right? It's not a really efficient engine. All right? So what he did, okay, is he improved on it. He reduced the amount of heat required to operate it, okay, and made it three times more efficient. Okay. And again, they needed big boilers, the big drawbacks for all of them. Big boilers to create steam, okay, and steam engines could not be made small enough to replace, okay, like horse drawn carriages. The horseless carriage idea couldn't come along until steam engines were no longer used. Steam engines could be used on a train, however, because trains were much bigger. All right. Internal combustion engine. Okay. So Robert Steele, he looked for a different source of energy to replace steam because the way generally people made steam was the use of coal. Okay. And while coal generates a lot of heat, it's also very, very dirty. All right. It releases a lot of heavy, sooty black smoke. All right. Uh, so he designed this idea that would make uh, explosions, okay, for a piston engine that was fueled by gas from tar and oil that would be ignited by flames. This was the the great, great, great granddaddy of the gasoline powered engine. All right. So he made this uh, he made this thing and then a little later on Philip Labon okay got uh, his idea here. He used coal gas. Okay. Coal gas was great. It was hotter, burned hotter, it was easier to get. Problem it's a gas, and it's explosive, okay? And it wasn't something you wanted a tank full of on your driving around on your horseless carriage, okay? Unless you wanted a fiery carriage shortly thereafter, all right? Um, so it wasn't, wasn't really used, and it wasn't very efficient. The big thing the internal combustion had a problem with was friction. You've got a piston moving up and down inside a cylinder, and there's no liquid water in there, okay? No gaseous water in there, so there's nothing to lubricate it. Right? And so usually once they got hot and the piston started expanding, it would essentially just grind to a halt against the walls of the cylinder and whatever connecting rod was pushing on the bottom of it would snap. Okay? And then the engine would be destroyed. So they had to find some way to, to fix that. One of the first ways was the two-stroke combustion engine. If you have a, let's say, a, a weed eater okay, at home where you have to mix oil in with the gas or a chainsaw where you got to mix oil in with the gas, that's a two-cycle engine. All right? You actually put the lubricant in with the fuel 
and that lubricates the piston as it moves up and down. Okay, it's okay, but it's dirty, right? It because you burn the oil as you burn the gas, and it releases a sooty, like oily smoke. All right, so a little bit better. Okay, auto. Uh, NA Auto and Eugene Longan, okay, they improve the efficiency of the engine by compressing the coal gas mixture before it ignited. And that was the true kind of ancestor of the internal combustion engine. So here's what we got. Here's your piston, one of them, okay, in an internal combustion engine. There's various phases to the uh, work that, a, that an internal combustion engine does. Okay, an internal combustion engine has a piston. Okay, that's this thing here that compresses the gas and can catch, uh, essentially seal the chamber. You've got your connecting rod, okay, and your crankshaft down here. That's connected to essentially the drivetrain of the car or whatever it is you're, you're using. You also have in a basic engine one intake valve and one exhaust valve. If you have an engine that is a twin cam engine, you may have two of each. Okay, or if you have a Ferrari, you may have five valves per cylinder. Okay? They would have three exhaust and two intake. All right. Anyway, you've got an intake valve. The intake valve is what allows the air fuel mixture into the cylinder. So during the intake phase, the piston is moving down. When the piston moves down, it creates a vacuum. Okay? That's what draws the uh, intake valve down and the air fuel mixture in. All right, so as the piston moves down, this valve pops down, and the air fuel mixture comes in. Once it gets to the bottom, the vacuum is gone, and the, this valve pops back into a sealed position, and the piston moves up. All right, as the piston moves up, we're talking about now compressing that air fuel mixture. And when you compress it, you make it more volatile, and that means more explosive. Okay, so we're compressing the gas as the piston moves up. When the piston gets to its highest point, the spark plug sparks and that spark detonates this compressed air fuel mixture all right when that happens the gases expand and they force the piston down all right this is what we call the power stroke okay or the expansion phase so this is where all the power of the engine is generated pushes it down okay when it gets to the bottom it continues on its way up the valve lifters push the valve down okay and the piston moves back up pushing all the exhaust gases out the exhaust valve all right. Now that's kind of a simplified way of how it all works, right? But essentially that's how it works. All right. Okay. So the drawbacks again: the auto engine used coal gas as a fuel. It doesn't burn very hot, so the engine wasn't very powerful. Okay. It wasn't until we discovered things like gasoline okay, that allowed us to make very powerful engines because gasoline was okay quite a bit hotter burning and could create better expansion of gases. Done. Right, it takes two full cycles of the piston in order for the, the full cycle of combustion to be completed. Yeah. What's that? Diesel, same. They have, they have are you sure? They have glow plugs to heat the fuel previ previous to that. Uh, just when it's cold. All right, so the engine here, the, the big point of this, guys, is that an internal combustion engine can be small because you don't have to have a big area for the burning of coal, okay? You don't have to have a huge boiler of water, okay? You can just have this small combustion chamber and a tank of fuel, all right? So this is what made the automobile possible, okay? It was the invention of the internal combustion engine. All right. Um, okay, and then future technologies, you don't need to worry about that, okay? So there's a few here that I'm going to want you to answer. Um, and those are going to be... number seven. Number Okay, I want you to answer those ones. 7, 8, 9, and 12. Let's get those done here before class is over. Okay, um, so for number 7 here, guys, the two advantages and two disadvantages of the steam engine. Okay, the advantages were, I mean, it worked. 
Okay, and we could make it pretty efficient. Okay, the disadvantages, they're gigantic. Okay, and they generally needed coal, okay, which was a, a, essentially a dirty burning fuel. Okay, um, what innovation did Daimler introduce to the internal combustion engine? Okay, well, Daimler, if we go back to here, all right, um, one more page here. Okay, Daimler designed petroleum-fueled internal combustion engine. He's the guy who came up with, let's use gasoline as opposed to coal, gas, and kerosene, and stuff like that that's, that's uh, much more difficult to use. Okay, um, for number nine, in the internal combustion four-stroke engine, what's the purpose of the intake valve and the exhaust valve? The intake valve allows the fuel-air mixture into the combustion chamber. The exhaust valve allows the carbon dioxide and waste gases out of the combustion chamber. Right? And number 12, why was the internal combustion engine rather than the steam engine chosen to propel road vehicles? Um, well, just, I mean, to some extent it might be a little less dangerous, but if you had a steam engine, you'd have to have somebody shoveling coal into it all the time. Right? If you use a liquid fuel like gasoline, you can have an electric fuel pump, okay? or you can even, in the older vehicles, they use the vacuum pressure okay, produced in the pistons to, to actually suck the fuel right out okay, of, the, uh, of the gas tank. Okay? But an electric fuel pump will simply pump the liquid fuel in there. And there's no need for one of your family members to stand in the tailgate or the uh, box of the truck and shovel fuel, shovel coal into the combustion area of the steam engine. Right? Simply not convenient. Now, is that going to stay that way forever? Who knows? Steam engines are efficient, and if we could find a way to efficiently heat the steam, heat the water and stuff like that, you might you never know what you might see. Right? Uh, if you look at, for example, uh, aircraft carriers and things like that, okay, they use nuclear power to heat steam in a turbine. Okay, turn the turbine. So okay, there are those kind of things. And you're not gonna have a nuclear powered car anytime soon, okay, for obvious reasons. You would have to have a nuclear reactor on your car and well, then you'd have uranium or plutonium or something like that on board. And there are irresponsible people who might use that for a destructive purpose. Plus, if you got in an accident, well, you might cause some sort of nuclear catastrophe, which would be bad. All right? So you probably won't see that in the future, but, hey. Okay. All right. Everybody with me on this stuff here? Okay. Now, uh, tomorrow, guys, we're probably going to start into scalars and vectors. I think that's lesson six in your notes. Please bring a calculator, all right? Because you're going to need to do some calculations tomorrow. Also, okay.